you for joining us. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years. And now this video is to rebut Kent Hovind's stupid seminar on the age of the earth. It becomes clear once again that this proven liar and convicted fraudster does not hold a PhD and apparently doesn't even remember much high school science. Did you know the word universe comes from two Latin words? Uni means single and verse is a spoken sentence. Did you know we live in a universe, a single spoken sentence? God said, let there be. Oh man, what an idiot. He says he taught high school science for 15 years, but he doesn't even have the skills of a middle school child who has learned how to look up an etymology. The word verse does not mean sentence. It comes from the Latin vertere, which means to turn. Combine vertere with uni, and they make the Latin word universus, which means entirety, or all turned into one. That is the origin of the word universe. I learned all of this in about 30 seconds just by opening a dictionary. How pathetic is Hovind? Well, let's skip all the crap. Well, not all the crap, we'd have to skip the whole video for that. But let's skip to where he actually talks crap about science. I'm also going to skip the parts I've already rebutted in earlier videos, or that have already been rebutted by Thunderfoot, CDK007, and others. In 1800, there was only one billion people here. And everybody agrees the population is growing rapidly. But the world is not overcrowded. Now, if you believe in evolution, you got a problem. Because you think man's been here for three million years. Wow. In three million years, the population would have grown. What an idiot! The limit on population is not how crowded it is, but how many resources are available. That curve starting around 1800 isn't part of a normal exponential growth curve. Something happened, and something else must have happened about 7,000 years ago. This is the time when people started living in cities and began writing. This increased both knowledge and commerce. Before then, the population was kept in check by limited resources. The available food, for example, meant that if the population got too high, too many people would starve. But now, food and other resources could be obtained more easily and efficiently, and with a larger support structure than ever before, more people could survive and reproduce. This continued on until around 1800, about the start of the Industrial Revolution, where this really accelerated. Rapid transit over both land and water, increased communication, technology allowing the freezing and canning of food, and many other developments, began to allow humanity to support a population unlike what it had ever seen before. If our technology went away, so would most of the people. The galaxies up there are spinning, but the stars on the outside are going faster than the stars on the inside. Wrong, you incompetent boob. It's the other way around. Kepler figured that out centuries ago. The gra galaxies gradually lose their spiral shape. So the question is, if they're billions of years old, why are they still spiral shaped? Wrong, wrong, wrong. This wonderkin somehow has the idea that spiral arms are literally arms, and the more the galaxy rotates, the more twisted they get, and the more further out they get flung. What a load of ignorant rubbish! It's been known for decades that the spiral shape is caused by gravitational waves, and that stars move in and out of these spirals as they move about the galaxy. This has been known since the 1960s, and yet this brainiac claims to have taught high school science for 15 years. Some evolutionists say, well, new stars are forming to replace the ones that are blowing up. Well, that's baloney. Nobody's ever seen a star forming. Again, this is blatantly false. We've seen numerous star systems at various stages of their formation. We've never seen one instantly form, but that's only because they don't form instantly. Formation takes thousands of years. The teachers are taught to tell their kids that red stars slowly evolve into white dwarf stars, and it takes billions and billions of years for this to happen. Study back in history, Sirius was a red star, today Sirius is a white dwarf star. Yet the textbook says it takes billions of years. What a moron! Sirius is, in fact, a binary star system, which he would know if he'd read his own slide. Sirius is a red star orbited by a white dwarf. It is the red star that is visible from Earth with the naked eye. Only through a telescope can its white dwarf companion be seen. Hovind could have easily looked this up, and again, this liar claims to have taught high school science for 15 years, so he should have had this fact easily at his disposal. Some of the planets are cooling off. 
You can't just keep cooling off. Pretty soon you're cooled off. These planets cannot be billions of years old. What does he mean they're cooling off? The planets in our solar system are cold. The warmest ones are Mercury, which is closest to the Sun, and Venus, which has greenhouse gases that trap the Sun's heat. Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus are all very cold. The surface temperature of Jupiter is only 165 kelvins, or 162 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Saturn and Uranus are even colder, at 134 kelvins and 76 kelvins respectively. But if you're a creationist, I guess the only way you can support your insanity is by pulling figures out of Uranus. Jupiter has a moon called Ganymede, but it still has a strong magnetic field indicating a hot inner, inner core. Even the atheist will admit it should have cooled off billions of years ago. Apparently, this multiple Nobel Prize laureate has never even heard of tidal forces, nor considered the fact that Ganymede is orbiting the largest planet in our solar system. It is tidal friction that maintains Ganymede's molten core, and by extension, its magnetosphere. Saturn has rings around it, but the rings are slowly moving away from the planet. Saturn's rings are indication that it is not billions of years old. Stupid, stupid, stupid. The effect he's talking about is the pointing robertson effect, but it only applies to dust orbiting the Sun. Saturn's rings are held in place by shepherd moons, and every time one of these moons comes by, it corrals the rings back into place. In fact, the rings aren't expanding out, they're collapsing in because their shepherd moons are collapsing in, and in about 100 million years, they'll be gone entirely. But the system is certainly sustainable for a mere 5,000 years, and the billions of years since the planet formed is no problem either. The rings will last as long as the shepherd moons will. The moon is going around the Earth. But you know, as the moon goes around, it's gradually getting further away. We're slowly losing the moon. Well, if you bring the moon in closer, you start to create a problem because the moon causes the tides. There's a law called the inverse square law. Sorry, Kent, but it's the inverse square law with gravity. With tidal forces, it's the inverse cube law. You should have remembered that from your 15 years teaching high school science. If you run all the math on this, you'll find out about 1.2 billion years ago, the moon was whizzing around just above the surface of the Earth. The moon is accelerating away. So although it was moving away in the past, the rate at which it was moving away was much slower. There are other factors involved in how big the tides are. Most notably, the tidal dissipation. This is the effect of the tides on the Earth's day. The day has been getting longer as a result. Since the moon was closer in the past, this effect would have been larger in the past. This means that the tides would have been lower relative to the tidal force since it didn't have as much time to act on them. The sad thing is he acknowledges this fact later in the video, presumably spreading them out so that you won't make the association. The Earth is spinning about a thousand miles an hour at the equator, but the Earth is slowing down, which means it used to be going faster. Now you go back a few billion years, the Earth was spinning real fast. If you do the real math, you find that the Earth started with about a 15 hour day. So the moon couldn't have been as close as Hovind says, and the tides couldn't have been as bad as he says, and the Earth couldn't have been spinning as much as he says. On his high school exam, he's getting an F. How on earth did he get the credentials to teach for 15 years? Uh, Sahara Desert has what's called a prevailing wind pattern. The process is called a desertification. After studying Sahara for a long time, they said, we think that desert's about 4,000 years old. If the Earth is millions of years old, why don't we have a bigger desert someplace? Because, you reject from a moron academy, the desertification started because of a shift in the Earth's axis, which happens on a 25,800 year cycle. A few thousand years ago, the Sahara was very fertile, but then the precession made it so that this region was closest to the sun during its local summer. The extreme heat started the desertification. On the flip side of the processional cycle, the Sahara will be cooler, and it will be much better able to rejuvenate itself. In another 20,000 years, it might well be a fertile area again before another cycle causes more desertification. Comets are flying around through space, but they're always losing material. That's what makes the tail on a comet. Comets indicate the solar system is less than 10,000 years old. The Oort cloud. That's their answer to why we still have comets. Nobody's ever seen the Oort cloud. The whole thing is based on a mathematical mistake. There is no Oort cloud. Wrong again, Kent. 
While the Oort cloud probably exists, the short period comets come from the Kuiper belt. Numerous Kuiper belt objects have been found. Computer simulations have confirmed that this excellently accounts for all of the short period comets. I think you're beginning to notice a big problem with the creationist mindset. They assume that if something is happening, it has always been happening, it has always been happening at that rate, and they are completely unable to comprehend ideas such as cycles and acceleration. This accounts for a lot of the reasons why they say such mind-numbingly stupid things.